And I sure hope that you have experienced that awakening in your soul where you went from imprisoned, your spirit imprisoned in sin. It says, long as my spirit been in prison. And, and, and I woke, uh, 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 there was a quickening ray, like God showed me his love and his grace poured out to me in the gospel. And then I I boldly approach his throne. And there is no condemnation, not because I'm self-righteous or because I'm good enough, but there's no condemnation because Christ has paid for all of my sin. And I sure hope that you know that joy and that grace and that freedom um, and that reconciled relationship with God. That is what this text is all about this morning. Turn with me to Romans 1. 16 through 17. Romans 1, 16 through 17. Before we read, let's, let's pray. Father, we just sang some powerful truths. Lord, some, the truths that have set us free. Lord, uh, through your word this morning, help us to see wonders. Help us to see the goodness of Lord, and help of, of who you are and what you've done for us and help us to also apply it to our life. For there is a world, a dark and confused and chaotic world that is in desperate need of the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be who you've called us to be. Lord, use me this morning as just a sinner with a great Savior, Lord, that you have called me and you've made me a saint, not of anything that I have deserved, completely unmerited, but because of your love poured out to me. And Lord, use me as just a broken vessel to proclaim your truth. In your name, amen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This morning, I want to break that into three parts. First, that he's not ashamed of the gospel. Second, why is he not ashamed of the gospel? And third, where is the power here? What is the power he's talking about? So first, Paul starts out, I am not ashamed of the gospel. We see this all throughout Paul's life. We see him being bold in so many different settings. He's bold with the Athenian Greek philosophers in Athens, and they have all this wisdom, and they have all these, all they do all day is sit around. This is in Acts 17. They sit around, and they just hear new things from other parts of the world, and they just want to be enlightened. They just want to be more enlightened. And so they have this inscription on like this idol, and it says, to an unknown God. It's in that culture that Pontius Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? All this information that they had from all over the world, you know, like Greek, Greek uh, culture had gone out through all the world. So they had all this information, and yet they were so confused. They said, to an unknown God. And Paul says, what you are proclaiming unknown, I proclaim to you that the God who made the heavens and the earth isn't this little idol. He's so big, and this God, then he explains the gospel to them boldly, publicly, and he doesn't care if he gets persecuted. He doesn't care if he thinks they're cra he's crazy, and there was a lot of different. Every time anyone spoke in the New Testament, there was a lot of different reactions every time they spoke. Different reactions each time. He wasn't intimidated in Jerusalem by the Jewish zealots, the Jewish zealots who crucified our Savior. He wasn't ashamed of them. He wasn't afraid of them. He wasn't intimidated by them. He wasn't intimidated in Philippi by the materialistic superstitious. If you remember that story with the Philippian jailer, we talked about this as we were um, going through the book of Philippians and how there was this girl who had this demonic spirit that just controlled her and these men used her and the superstitions of their day to make a lot of money off of her. And Paul sets her free 
and they're mad that they just lost their income and then they beat him, throw him in prison. But he's not ashamed. And what does he do when he's in prison? He praises God in prison. And then he stays in prison after the, 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 the prison gates are opened and, and God allows for him to go out. He stays there so that he can reach the jailer for the gospel. He is not ashamed of the gospel. And church, I want to ask you this question. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of the gospel? When an opportunity arises, do you kind of shy? Oh, it's going to be awkward. They might, they might think I'm kind of weird. I don't want to talk about Jesus in this situation. Sometimes it's like wide open, right? Like somebody literally asks you, what do you believe about God? Many times it's they're talking about the issues in our culture and if we have in the front of our mindset that this person needs Jesus and that people need Jesus more than anything else, then we will look for opportunities as we talk about issues in our culture to share the gospel in that situation. And I want to ask you, are you bold enough to do that today? Because times in my life, I was not bold enough. I could identify a little more with Peter before the resurrection of Christ where Peter denied Jesus three times. I could identify more with him, but church, we cannot stay there. We cannot stay there. Peter didn't stay there. Paul wasn't there. There is too much at stake. There is too much at stake. It's time for America to have another great awakening. Could it happen in our lifetime? Oh, I long for it. I long for it. I see an America that is more divided than I've ever seen in my life. I see political mess. I see racial tension. I see this COVID virus bringing out more division, more, more tension. Everybody's on edge. Everybody's mad at everybody over sometimes the littlest things. People need the Lord today and we need a great awakening in America and we can't sit around expecting some politician to fix the mess. The church is called to be the answer wherever we are. And in this culture, we are the answer for America. We are. You are the answer for America today. The racial tension, there needs, forgiveness needs to happen. Relationships need to be established. And that is all in the gospel. Reconciliation. It's all in the gospel. And so we, the church, are called to be that today, and we cannot sit around and, and just go through the motions anymore. we got to cut that out. I went on a vacation recently where I ended up talking to a guy about the Lord as you're sitting in the hot tub, and I find out that he's a Christian. I'm like, sweet. We start talking about the Lord, and he just he says, you know what's the problem with the church today? People don't have a passion for souls anymore. And I thought, that is so true. That is so true. We need the passion back, church. And the passion comes from what? How people are going to respond? No. Paul doesn't say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I'm going to like, like everybody's going to come and I'm going to have this big following, and it's going to be a big, happy, kumbaya singing experience, and we're all going to just have, like, it's going to be awesome. No. He says, I am not ashamed. Why? Because it is the power to save. It is powerful to save. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. Buddha didn't do it. Muhammad didn't do it. They're all dead in their graves. There is no other name. There's no other God that walked this earth, lived a perfect life, and showed it through everything he did. There's no dirt on Christ. Everybody who lived with Jesus believed in him. All of his disciples who lived with him, his brother, his own brother, even the guy who who turned his back on him, Judas, was so bitter about what he did that he hung himself. 
I mean, Jesus is, stands way, way uh, uh, on a whole different level than all the other gods of this world and all the other human tradition and human philosophy. Now, there are good things in other religions. There are good things that are taught in those religions. And that a lot of times is the danger because just because there's some good things in those religions, people think, well, that must be true. But church, there's no power in those religions, is there? There's no power whatsoever in those religions. All they have are self-help things, religious practice to try to get you to become more self-righteous where you can get to the point of nirvana or you can get to the point of enlightenment or you can get to the point of knowing more and getting and saving yourself in a sense. The gospel says you can never save yourself. The gospel is Jesus came, lived a perfect life, died for sinners, died for you and for me and all of us have sinned and then he rose from the grave to defeat death for you and for me. That is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God and there's nothing else that even comes close to it. It's like D.L. Moody said, he said, you know, there was a a world religions uh, conference in Chicago and D.L. Moody said um, to someone who, who, he was responding to someone who said to him, you need to go and explain how all of those world religions are false. And D.L. Moody said, I just need to tell him the gospel. It will stand so high above all those other world religions that that it, it will be effective. The gospel simply needs to be unleashed. It just needs to be unleashed. That's all. Like we just need to share it with people, with our lives and with our words. So why is he not ashamed? Because of the power of God. And secondly, I believe because man is utter depraved, utterly depraved and lost and cannot, cannot do it on their own. They cannot seek God out on their own without the spirit drawing them. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. And so that is why we shouldn't be surprised. And later on in Romans, he says, no one seeks after God, not even one. Everybody is stuck in their own comfortable mess with their boat and their nice house and their weekend for themselves and their alcohol and their partying. And that is what they're content with. So they don't seek God, Paul says. Like they're not seeking after God. They're perfectly content in the despair of living life to get fat, to die with no hope whatsoever. Because they want to live life that way. John said this. He said, he, he said man, light is coming to the world, but man didn't care because they just love darkness. So do you feel some urgency? You should. You should feel some urgency because you know what? How does God reach the lost? Through us. He reaches the lost through us, church. Like God uses us to shake things up. And I'm telling you, in our culture today, things are getting shaken up all over the place, right? It's it's getting getting shaken up in the church. It's getting shaken up outside the church. In politics, everything is getting shaken up and we need to go, Lord, what do you want me to do in the midst of this chaos? Because we are the light of the world. And in Romans 10, 14, Paul says this, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have never heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? People are comfortable in the darkness, and they need the gospel. And so we cannot be ashamed of the gospel because it is what's powerful to save. Now, I have these uh, ducks at home that many of you when, you, when you hear my devotionals online, you hear me competing with my ducks because sometimes they're so loud. I almost have to like tell them to be quiet. You know, they're just like quack, 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 quack. They're hilarious. They're fascinating little creatures, and I really have enjoyed them. They, we thought we were just going to get one of them, But we ended up finding out Heidi was going to get one duck because she wanted to show her son how much she loved him. She's going to get this duck. And then she finds out that she had to have two. You can't take just one. They have to come in a pair. And I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen creatures be so attached at the hip. They literally don't go. One of them doesn't go away from the other. Always together. Always. One of them goes under the water. The other one goes under the water. It's hilarious. Okay. But as wonderful as those little ducks are, they're really dumb. 
You know, they're just dumb. Sheep are like that. We're called sheep. We're kind of like those ducks. And let me give you an example. When um, we used to put the duck, ducks under the deck, and they didn't like going under there. They sometimes would fight us being put under there. We, we put them under there because we saw foxes out in our neighborhood. And then also they, they just dirty up my pond so bad that I have to like give the pond a break from the duck. So I'm putting them underneath the deck and then we open up the deck so they can get out. We got food out here and I talk to them because they always talk to me. I talk quack, quack, quack and I bring their food, food out and I'm quack, 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 quack. Come on, come on. And they won't come out. They just sit there looking at you like you're stupid. And you're like, are you guys gonna, are you guys, cra-? like well, they love their pond. They love to swim in their pond. If they stay under that, that deck, they're going to die. There's no water. There's, I mean, the food's out here. We had to go underneath the deck and shoo them out. The six foot eight guy, and I finally just started getting Taylor to do it because I'm like, dude, I can't, I can't do this. You know, I'm climbing in the mud under the deck to get them out. It's super uncomfortable. I'm getting dirty and I'm shooing these ducks out from underneath the deck. The same thing, like we have this little pump house. We put in the pump house and it's, uh, Literally, the door is right there. The first time I, I wanted to let them out, I slide open the door, quack, 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 nothing. They, they, just, they just stay there. It's like they're stuck in fear. And they want to come out. I know this because every morning when I come out of the house and they're there, if, if I forget to let them out, they're there just quacking at me like crazy. Like most dogs just look at you when they want fed. These ducks tell you when they want fed. So I know they want out, but they're stuck. They're stuck, and I got to push them out. And if I don't push them out, they're going to die. And that's how the world is, you guys. The world is dying. They're in darkness. If we believe what the Bible says, they are in darkness. And they're going to be separate from God for eternity in a literal place called hell. Like, that's what the Bible said. Jesus talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. This is a real place, and God has to... Be just, and he can't allow sin to enter into heaven. He can't allow people in their sinful state to enter into heaven. It just doesn't happen. It's impossible. It cannot happen before a just God. And he has called us to share the only truth that frees them. The only truth. To share it with people and unleash the gospel. And church, we're going to get a little uncomfortable. We're going to get a little dirty. It's going to be, it might even be a little painful. Because while we don't get persecuted like Paul did and the early church did, where they were killed and tortured and all of that, we have more of a subtle persecution that it, 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 it's like, you have your truth. I have my truth. You're happy. I'm happy. Don't talk to me about it. Don't make me uncomfortable. Let's not have awkward conversations. Let's just pretend everything's fine. That is satanic. It's satanic and it keeps our culture stuck. It's like, oh, the ducks are under the deck. They want to be under there. Oh, well. And then they fry under 90 degree heat. And that's how it is for the world. And God has given us a mission. And the church has lost that passion. I really believe that's why America has struggled so much because the church has lost its passion to reach the lost. We have started to believe the lie that it's okay. I can't change that person. And you know what? I can't change anybody, but I can be faithful and God can use me to change that person. God can use us. (coughs) Corona. (coughs) Or allergies, right? So he's not ashamed because it is the power to save. And where is the power? The power is in the righteousness of God. That is the power. The power is the righteousness of God, not a self-righteous attitude where I think I've got enough good deeds stored up for me, ignoring the bad things I've done. It's in the complete, perfect righteousness of God given to us through the gospel. That is what he's talking about here. That's where the power comes from. This word power is the word dunamis, which is a a word for dynamite. That's where we get our word dynamite. Why did Paul use that word in in this statement? You know why I believe he used this word? Because 
in the midst of the hard, hard stronghold culture of the Greek culture where they didn't want to hear about Jesus and they thought it was a sham. They thought it was ridiculous that God would die on our cross where we kill uh, criminals. Are you kidding me? That's crazy. That was a huge stronghold. You mean the Christians, I should go be a Christian? Those guys like eat people. They do communion. Isn't that where they like eat people? There was all these rumors out there about Christians. And don't they like, don't they say that they're slaves? Like doesn't, doesn't their like leader call himself a slave? Are you kidding me? It was a very, very hard culture for the gospel to, to reach. It's like a crevice of a rock. Picture this, a crevice of a rock. You can try as much as you might with pulling that rock apart and breaking it. It will never happen, no matter how strong you are. But if you put some dynamite in there, what happens? It just blows up. It just blows up. And the Greek culture was like that rock cliff. Check this out. Archaeologists uncovered a caricature from the time of the early persecuted church. It depicts a slave bowing down before a cross. His name is Alex Manos. This slave is bowing down before a cross, and it says, it says underneath it, the slave Alex Manos worships his God. And you know what is on the cross? A donkey. A donkey is on the cross. This was during the early church, the persecuted church. Guys, this is the mountain that that church had to overcome. They thought that Christianity was a joke. It was hilarious. They laughed at it. Look at those idiot Christians. Like they worship us. They worship, it's a joke. Somebody who died on a cross, that's crazy. And you guys, even in the midst of that, and the fact that the Greek gods were so indifferent, the Greek gods that they've been taught since they were little kids were indifferent gods that kind of just like did their own thing. They were more like humans than anything. They were detached and they were remote. And, and, and in that culture, the gospel exploded and they could not stop it. No matter how hard the soil was, it exploded. And Christianity took over the Roman culture. Why? There's only one reason why, because it is in the power of the precious blood of Jesus shed for sinners to take away their sin. This, this phrase, salvation and the righteousness of God, the word salvation and the righteousness of God are really umbrella terms that encompasses all that we receive in the righteousness of God. It encompasses all of the gospel, all of the gospel, because he said the gospel saves from the righteousness of God. Now, how, does the, how do we get the righteousness of God? Through faith. Faith opens the door for that. We get it through faith. And what is it? It's we're justified before, we, we just sang it. Like, no condemnation. I don't have to think like, is God mad at me? Is God gonna like cast me away from his presence someday? No, like there's no condemnation because I repented of my sin. I look to Christ, my savior. And when I meet God someday, he's gonna ask me, why should I allow you into heaven? And I'm gonna say, because your son died for my sins. Your son paid for my sins. And I cling to the cross. That is where my salvation comes. And I'm justified and God looks at me completely righteous. And so he doesn't see any of my sin. He sees his imputed righteousness to me, given to me. That's what he sees. And then I'm redeemed. I'm reconciled to God. I'm I, I go through a process of sanctification where he's working in me and his Holy Spirit is given to me. I read this at the beginning of the, the service in Ephesians where we are given the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. That spirit is at work in us and he's sanctifying us. And then we're glorified someday with Christ and we'll be seated with him and we will be like him. We will be like him. We will receive a body like his that is imperishable, unfading, kept in heaven for you and for you and for you and for you. And for anyone who knows Christ, that body 
exist for you. It's for the glory of God, and it's because of his goodness given to us. That is the gospel. That is the gospel. And church, the world is desperate for it, and they don't even know it. They're like those ducks. They're like those ducks that is stuck. They're stuck in fear. I don't know what's going through those ducks' minds. I don't know what's going through anybody's minds when they, re- when they reject Christianity, when they act like they don't care. But they need to be pushed. Push them out. Push them out. Pray for them. Continue to pursue them so that they hear the gospel and they come to know Christ as their Savior. Because at the end of the day, I want to know. I don't want to like die and then go, I didn't share Christ with that person. Why didn't I share Christ with that person? And the only answer is because I caved to the cultural strongholds of my day. Because I was a little scared about being a little uncomfortable. Because I was content in my salvation. I don't want to ever get to that point. Church, never, never give up. Never give up. You know, last Sunday I talked about my cousin who was in town and how we prayed together by name for our cousins. The one that I was the closest to that I have prayed and prayed for and prayed for for the last almost 20 years. Almost 20 years I have prayed for this cousin. We were close together. We used to hang out all the time. We were in church together. We were in youth group. He comes from a strong Christian family. And then when we left high school, I went to Bible school. My faith became more and more my own. And he went to a, a secular college that he just got further and further away. And he got indoctrinated into man-made philosophies. And his faith got attacked. And he just turned away from God. And he talked to me one time when I was trying to talk to him about Jesus over the phone. He said, it's, it's a sham. I'll never forget that word. It's a sham. He looked at Christianity like those Greeks did, like those Romans did. It's a joke, man. Like, come on. Like, and he started, he just asked me question after question, and, and I would try to answer him. And eventually, he didn't want to talk to me anymore. And I tried about that issue. And then I, I, we had a family reunion a couple years back. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go to it. He wouldn't, I hadn't seen him since my wedding, and I'm like begging him to come. And the enemy has just got a foothold in his life. And I'm like, is he ever going to come back to the Lord? And my cousin was here last week and we prayed over him by name. My mom texted me this morning and she said, cousin Rob's returned to the Lord. He said, he's done running. (laughs) Amen, right? Like, I'm just like, I'm like in heaven. And I'm like thinking, I'm like thinking, this is so healing for me because like I've been praying for him. Like when we used to hang out, my faith was very compartmentalized. When we used to hang out in the church, in our youth group, you know what we talked about more youth group? Girls. Like it was all about girls, 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 girls. That's like all I remember talking about with him. We didn't get into Bible studies together. We didn't encourage each other's faith that I remember. I mean, we had a lot of fun, but it wasn't, I don't know how authentic my faith was around him. And then I went off to college and I'm like, like, did I fail? I I fail. Maybe if, maybe if my faith would have been more solid, more authentic, more real. I was experiencing these real relationships at Bible college where we were able to keep each other accountable on issues like lust and things like that. And we're, we're growing in our faith. It's becoming real and authentic. And we're seeing God give us this passion for a dark world. And I never had that with him. And we grew up together just goofing off. And I'm like, what did I do, man? And then like, God is powerful enough. The gospel is powerful enough to save him. Even through my immature pretense faith that was, that, that was maybe more self-righteous than anything at the time, And God saved him even through that horrible example. And so that is the power of the gospel. So never give up praying for someone. And Rob's, if you're going to watch this sermon or if you're watching it, man, I'm just, I'm so excited. And I never told you this, but I'm I'm sorry if my faith wasn't authentic enough back then. Um, And I'm glad that God has forgiven me and 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 he's working in your life. Praise the Lord. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do with you. Um, 
He's incredibly gifted with music and all kinds of things. And I'm just like, man, God can use him in an immense way. And I just pray that that will multiply. So church, what does this mean for you today? This means, church, don't ever stop fighting the good fight. Don't let the enemy say to you, oh, it's just too strong. You know, America's too lost. It's too far gone. You know, people just don't want to hear about the gospel. They don't care. Like they'll never come to, that's what Satan wants to do. And then we just go, you know what? I'm just going to focus on my own relationship with the Lord and the rest, I guess, you know, live and let die, I guess. What, is that guns and roses? You know, live and let die. No, like that is not, we will miss out on so much if, that, if, if that's how we live. We will miss out on so much. So church, I want to start a new initiative this year. In the midst of all this chaos, in the midst of all, all the, the problems that are existing in our culture with coronavirus and, and, and racial tension and political mess, and we got this, we got this uh, political season coming up where when our president is elected, whoever it's going to be, we could have major riots. It could get worse and worse. And I'm going, you know what? What is God going to do in the midst of all this? And what is he calling me to do? What is he calling you to do? I can't control the riots. I can't control the politics. I can't control coronavirus. That's for dang sure. I wish I could. I'm sick and tired of it. But you know what? Like I can say, God, what are you calling me to do? What are you calling your church to do? And you know what I want us to pray about as a church is I want us to pray about leading people to Jesus. Who in your life? Each one bring one. I'm going to call it that this year. Each one bring one. If every person in this church brought one person to Christ, what impact would it make? And church, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. I want to make sure you know that. It's like, don't just think, oh, I'm going to go out, I'm going to reach this, I'm going to pray for this person, and come and come to Jesus. It's going to take time. It's going to take devotion. It's going to take consistent working and strategically thinking, how can I reach this person? I'm going to invite them to this. I'm going to share Jesus with them during this conversation. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to just constantly show them how much I love them and how much they need to come to know Christ. I heard an atheist once in Vegas when I was on a missions trip there. And he said, he said, you know what bugs me about Christians is they believe that guys like me are going to hell and they never tell me about it. Like they don't even talk to me. He says, like, at the end of the day, I just think to myself, okay, they either don't believe it or they do, and they just don't care about me. And I thought, that is, I wonder how many people just think our faith is a sham because we don't even talk about it, because we don't tell people about it. Church, that's got to stop. Reach the lost, church. That is our mission, like to grow in our faith, to love Jesus so much that we're like, we got to talk to others about it. We've got to talk to others about it. And so what I want to do is I'm going to ask you at some point before the end of this year, and it's going to go on through next year, but I want to just have a time frame for myself. I want to ask you, each person in this church, who is it that you're praying for? Who is it? I want to pray for them. I want us to think about maybe there's a way that you could strategically reach this person. Is there any questions? Any questions or concerns you have on how to reach this person? It could be a neighbor. It could be a coworker. It could be somebody you see at the gas station every day. God has put people into our lives and America is lost and they need Jesus. And so we need to be bold with the gospel as Paul did. We need that urgency. So that's one thing. Another thing that I think will be a shot in the arm for our church is there's an event going on in Washington, D.C., it's in September 26th, and if, if, if we don't have a big outbreak or D.C. doesn't shut it down, we're going to do it. Any, anyone who is feeling led to, to go, you could bring your whole family if you wanted. It could just be you, but we're going to take a group, however big God makes that group, and we're going to go to D.C. We're going to leave on a Friday. That's the 25th of September. We're going to spend the day, the 26th, praying across denominational lines with believers for America to return and repent. And it's, that's the focus. The focus is the gospel and the focus is return and repent. So I'm praying that God would use that because our, our, our nation needs to turn back to the Lord. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna join together. We're gonna pray for our nation to return to the Lord. I want you to watch this video and then we're gonna close in prayer. 
This is Jonathan Kahn. We are standing at a critical moment in American and world history, a moment that can seal the future for calamity or redemption. We've driven God out of our culture and we war against his ways. If we don't return to God, America's light will go out. The answer is revival, but we only have a limited window of time. So this is the announcing of the return, the national and global day of prayer and repentance, Saturday, September 26, 2020, 40 days from the election and on the 400th anniversary of the sailing of the Mayflower at America's dedication to God. Join me for a pivotal, sacred, and prophetic gathering on the National Mall, Washington, D.C. If you can't make it there, the return will be all over America. Gather in your states, your churches, your homes to pray for repentance, return, revival, and restoration. On the promise, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. The return is for all of God's people, every denomination. And on board is everybody from Pat Robertson to Dr. Dobson, from Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lotz, to Martin Luther King's niece, Alveda King, and many, many more. Surrounding the day of the return will be the 10 ancient days of prayer and repentance, beginning with the Feast of Trumpets to Yom Kippur, September 18th to September 28th, to intensify our prayers and intercession for revival. And if you're outside America, join us on that day in your nation to pray not only for America, but for your nation and bring the return to your land. The return, September 26, 2020. Plan for it now. Spread the word in this video and go to the returnwebsite.org. That's the returnwebsite.org. The return begins now as you, me, and all of God's people not only pray for revival, but begin living in revival. It is time to seek the Lord. It's time to return. Said, this is kind of like a promise keepers type event. It's um, it's a lot of different denominations, and I know that that causes some concern. I was a little concerned about it, but when we get to heaven, there's not going to be like this denomination and this denomination. Thank God that we will all um, fully know as we are fully like as we, as we have been fully known, um, and we won't have that. But uh, for now, we're going to get together just to pray for our nation and ask people to return to repentance to return to Jesus. Um, is greatly needed today. And, and, and I really believe that in all of this that's going on, it's like, okay, it's, it's, it's discouraging, all the stuff that's going on, but man, God is doing something. So I want you to pray about that too. And if you're feeling led to go to that, then we'll have a sign-up sheet soon. We're just going to keep coming back to it. Um, and you can sign up to go, and um, we'll see what God does. So, all right, let's pray. Father, um, we do pray for our nation to return to you. Lord, we pray that, uh, that we would be obedient, that we would be obedient to your word, that we would be passionate for the lost. Lord, a world that desperately needs you, an America that has, that has turned away as a whole. But Lord, we thank you for the remnant, Lord, of the church is still here. Lord, people are still longing to, to be the light that you've called them to be. Lord, help us to be that. Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as their savior, I pray that you would put it on their heart to come forward after the service and to receive you as savior. To not have any more condemnation, to be free from the guilt of their sin, to know that Christ, that you died on the cross for their sins. And Lord, help us, those, all of us who have been born again, have been saved from our sin to be the light you've called us to be. In your name, amen.